안녕하십니까. 저는 이본 세션의 어, 모더레이터를 맡은 서울대학교 의료학과의 하지수입니다. 많은 여러분들께서 저희 디자인, 특히 창의적인 디자인에 관심을 가지시고 세션에 참석해 주셔서 굉장히 감사드립니다. 본 세션은 어, Parsons the New School for Design의 어, 딘으로 계신 사이먼 컬린스를 모시고 어, 스피킹을 들은 연설을 들은 후에 사디의 김승현 교수님과 그리고 성균관대학교의 이문혁 교수님의 디스커션으로 구성하도록 하겠습니다. 정확하게 한 시간 반이 되도록 제가 시간 조절을 할 텐데요. 어, 제가 세션을 시작하기 전에 연사분께 몇분 정도 스피치를 해주실 거냐고 여쭤더니 어, 청중에게 달려 있다고 말씀하셨습니다. <웃음> 만약에 굉장히 당신의 말을 지루하게 들으면 15분 만에 끝날 수도 있고 어, 이 리액션을 가지고 같이 많이 공감이 형성된다면 50분 이상 연설하시겠다고 하셨습니다. 그래서 어, 굉장히 초롱초롱한 눈빛으로 조금 졸리시기도 하겠지만 어, 함께 참여하셔서 굉장히 보람 있는 세션이 되도록 도와주시면 감사하겠습니다. 우선 어, 연사분의 소개를 드리면 어, 사이먼 컬린스는 현재 파슨스 더 스쿨 더 뉴스쿨 포 디자인의 어, 패션 부분의 학장으로 계십니다. 어, 파슨스를 졸업하셨고요. 그리고 20여 년 동안 다양한 어, 패션 인더스트리, 필라나 나이키, 그리고 제냐, 마크스 앤 스펜서 등에서 현장에서 직접 뛰면서 어, 패션 산업을 리딩해 오신 분이십니다. 어, 2008년에 학장으로 취임하시면서 팔슨스의 교육 시스템에 굉장히 획기적인 그리고 좀더 넓은 퍼스펙티브를 가지고 디자인 교육을 할수 있도록 어, 많은 변화를 가지고 오신 분입니다. 어, 김승현 교수님과 임은혁 교수님도 팔슨스 동문이시고요. 팔슨스와 뉴욕에서 어, 다양하게 패션 산업의 경험을 가지신 후에 현재 서울에서 후학을 어, 가르치고 있습니다. 어, 그러면 어, 박수로 따뜻하게 사이먼 컬린스를 맞아주시면 감사하겠습니다. 안녕하세요. someone from Parsons is watching you, and I'm convinced there'll be Parsons people in the audience here. So I'm going to talk to you for a little while about design uh, and about Parsons, about what we've done at Parsons over the past few years, and why design is vitally important. Um, I call this, um, this speech Creating Beautiful Solutions and the Campaign Against Bad Design. Uh, I'm angry about bad design. I really am. I don't like it. I'm, I'm shocked by it. I don't know why people put up with it. I don't know why we have to look around ourselves and see bad design. Um, and I think a lot of the time it's laziness. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I consider to be good design, why it works, and maybe some things you can take away with you. Um, so that as you go forwards, uh, maybe there'll be a couple of things you'll remember and, and maybe a couple of decisions will get made which create more good design. Um, Uh, the subtitle for this is A Recovering Fashion Designer's Random Thoughts on Turning a Design School into a Global Brand and a Polite Meander Towards Total World Domination. Uh, I really don't know how that translates into Korean, uh, but perhaps you'll see from the context of what I talk about uh, what I mean. So who am I? Um, uh, I was in the design industry for 20 years before I started uh, at Parsons. I worked for Xenia, Nike, Fila, Uh, Polo Ralph Lauren. I lived in London. I trained in England. I lived in London for 10 years in the, working in the industry there. Um, I worked in Italy. Then I moved to New York. Uh, and I also lived in Hong Kong for a couple of years. Uh, indeed, when I was in Hong Kong, I was creative director of Nike. Uh, so I traveled around the region. So I spent a lot of time in China, in Japan, in Korea, uh, in Malaysia, in Singapore, all over the region. Um, and I've, uh, uh, throughout my career, I've been pushing for good design. I didn't know why. when I was younger. Indeed, uh, I think if you see pictures of me when I was younger, uh, you could argue that I really didn't know anything about good design. Um, but I knew there was something going on. I knew it was important how we looked, how we dressed, and how we presented ourselves. And that's really part of uh, what I consider to be good design. Good design is not about nice clothes. That's not what I'm talking about. That's easy. You can just go and buy nice clothes. I'm talking about living good design. I'm talking about 
Everything you do. I was thinking about this um, earlier. I mean, I think about it all the time. There's nothing. There's nothing in this room. There's nothing in your lives that wasn't designed. Nothing. And when I look at the presentation yesterday on the future of Korean education, and I see the, uh, the passion that people have for science and technology, I think, great, you know, science and technology, they're very important. You certainly need both, but they don't affect all of us. But design does. Design affects all of us. And apparently, in the presentation yesterday, all that matters is science and technology. I don't get that. Why is it not science, technology, design? Anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, so here's me when I was younger. Um, embarking on my life of design. Um, now, I work for a design school. Uh, I actually, in the introduction, I said I'll talk for either 15 minutes or 45 minutes. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out where that's going to go. I'm, I meander through my conversation. And incidentally, uh, this is not a successful talk unless you guys ask me questions at the end. And they want to, they've got to be good questions. So in my, when I'm at my design school, I tell my students, ask smart questions. That's the only way that this becomes an interesting conversation. So uh, I ask difficult questions, and I also provide answers. And because I don't work for a corporation, I can be provocative. Here's my answer to this. Corporations, problem or solution. First thing they could do, sell less crap. That would be a good start. I mean, we talk about sustainability an awful lot in my school. Uh, we talk about how sustainable is the fashion industry. The answer is, in some areas, very sustainable. We deserve the right to wear nice clothes, if that's what we want to do. It's a human need. We want to look nice. But does that mean we have to buy and buy and buy and consume and consume and consume? Not really. Does that mean companies, all they should care about is selling more stuff? No, not really. Maybe if they sold a bit less crap, then the fashion industry would be a bit more sustainable. So that's the kind of conversation that I can get involved in in my role. This is us. This is Parsons in New York. Um, we're, you know, we're quite small for a, a, an institution, for a university. We have uh, 15, 1,600 students studying fashion, but we punch above our weight. This is the only stop on the city tour for tourists in New York City in the fashion center. There's nothing else for them to look at. So they pull their buses up outside my school and they take pictures. Uh, now, I think that kind of speaks to what we've done with Parsons as a brand. We used to be a, a, a design school that people maybe knew about a little bit, but they weren't quite sure why. Now we're not. Now people know exactly what we do. That's why there are buses that stop outside our school and they take pictures of us. And this is part of the reason. These are some of the people that went to our school. Uh, you can see uh, uh, three Koreans on there. So Hyun Lee being fairly well known. I'm sure most of you know who she is on the right hand side. Um, there's also Richard Chai on the bottom row. Du Ri Chung uh, on the top row. So uh, we're a very international school. And we've had some amazingly successful people go through our school. It's because we only do one thing. Brilliance. That's it. We're not a corporation. We're not trying to sell you anything. I don't care whether you like my school or not. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't want your money. We deal in one thing, and that's brilliance. So if we do a project, I guarantee you'll be surprised by it, and it will be brilliant. And it might be brilliant in a completely different way from what we were expecting. It might be, but that's OK, because we're not trying to sell anything. And this, I think, is one of those. I, I, I talk a lot to corporations, um, and I try to help them understand how to work with design. Uh, and this is something that they really struggle with, because they say, if I need to design a podium, I need a podium. And I want a podium, and I want to sell lots of podiums. And we say, yeah, yes, yes, you do. But if you don't open your mind to what else might be possible, then you're not going to succeed. And I think that's one of the problems with our education system globally. And if I'm honest, the education system here in Korea, there isn't the openness to creativity, the openness to failing, frankly, to doing something that doesn't really work. But that's OK, because you're open and you're learning something in the process. So our only, the only thing we aim for is brilliance. Now, here's an example of that. Um, the skirt on the left is designed and made by a student that's been with us for maybe 10 weeks. Now, for any of you that are not in fashion, that might mean nothing to you. The point I want to make here is that it used to be we would teach people to make very basic clothing. Very, we'd get, design a straight skirt and then learn how to make it. And that's what we would do. And that was OK. You know, Donna Karen did that, and she's very successful. Mark Jacobs did that. Tom Ford did that. They're very successful people. But we've realized over the past few years that we have to evolve and we have to innovate. And so now our approach to design is we teach someone to do something, and then we say to them, right, now you know how to use that tool. Go and do something creative with it. Don't just learn to use the tool. Create with it. And to me, that is living 
in a, a design-focused way, more than just teaching design. Because design, is, as I said at the beginning, design is not about nice clothes. Design is about living in a designed way, opening yourself up to creative solutions. The title of this talk, Creating Beautiful Solutions. That, that skirt right there, they could have just created a pencil skirt, a straight skirt. They would have learned to make it. That would be good. All done. But that's not enough. That's just a solution. I want a beautiful solution. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's creating a beautiful solution. The result of that is that we get to work with the best people in the world. They come to us because they want what we do. This is LVMH. This is a project that we did. So uh, people come to our events. They come to our parties, to our exhibitions, and they look around and they marvel because they cannot understand how a school can create the events that we do. And the answer is, when we work with LVMH, um, we came together with them, and they said they, they wanted to do something, but they didn't really know what it was. So we said, okay, leave it to us. So we chose 25 artisans working around New York City, people doing things with their hands that maybe they've been doing for 100 years. And we got teams of students, fashion design, photography, video, writing, and we put them together and we said, focus on that artisan, create a video documentary, design outfits inspired by their work, and then we will produce an event during Fashion Week which will showcase your work. So we did. But we didn't just produce an event during Fashion Week. The New York Times came to us and said they love what we're doing. They gave us an eight-page supplement to their newspaper. Anyone involved in any kind of media will know that's not an easy thing to come by. So eight pages in the New York Times. Then we gave a speech like this in the Times Center, which is a very prestigious place to do it. And then we had a party, a huge party, on Governor's Island, which is a big island in the middle of New York Harbor, before the island was even open to the public. And the reason was people were mesmerized by what we'd done, by what our students had done. They didn't know what to expect, but they, didn't, they couldn't see how this could have come from anywhere else apart from Parsons. And I think that's the unique thing that we do. This, the gentleman on the left uh, is an Italian shoemaker. Um, and I say shoemaker, he owns one of the biggest Italian manufacturing uh, concerns uh, um, in Italy. So uh, they make shoes for Gilles Sander, Christian Dior, uh, any big brand you can think of. They probably make their shoes there. And he came to us and he said, I'm bored. We work with all these amazing brands, but we don't get challenged. You know, we, we make shoes, that's great. We make more, we make more. It's great. It's all good. It's very successful. We make loads of money. But I'm not challenged. I'm not excited by what I'm doing. No one's pushing us. So he said, ask your students to design shoes that are going to be very difficult to make. And I think if you look at the shoes on the right, um, you'll see it's like a pair of scissors as a heel, which is incredibly difficult. And he loved it. And bearing in mind, can you point to another CEO an owner of a company who actually gets on a plane himself and goes and cuts around the leather, works with the students, literally stands at the table, as you can see there, with the students, chatting to them, finding out what they want, and still making shoes, even though he owns 11 shoe factories. So that's the kind of person that we like to work with. This is another example of what we do, which is unique. Louis Vuitton came to us, and they said, we don't know what you're doing, but we want a piece of it. We want to work with you. We want to be inspired by what you're doing. But what we don't want is for you to design any clothes for us. We already design clothes, and we've got enough, thanks. So we said, OK. <coughs> we said, give us your collection. Give us your samples, and let us do something with them. So on the right, you can see a classical music ensemble. Uh, I got the students into our gallery for one day. I gave them all of the Louis Vuitton samples, and I brought the classical music ensemble in to serenade them, to inspire them. So the students took the samples, $3,000 jackets, skirts, dresses, everything you can think of, and they cut them up, and they repurposed them into outfits for the classical music ensemble. So you can imagine the furore. We've got these big shop windows onto Fifth Avenue in New York City, downtown, and word got around amongst the media that we were cutting up a Louis Vuitton collection live. So they all raced down with their trucks, and they got their cameras outside, and they're filming our students doing this. Um, and it was a, a, a wonderful event. We had a party at the end of the day. We celebrated the work of the students. We chose the best one. Um, and we put that, uh, the outfits onto the classical music ensemble for a concert the next week. And so, again, people looked at this. They're like, how is this going on? What's the point of it? And I go back to what I said earlier. It's brilliance. We were looking for something brilliant to do with these samples, something new, something innovative. We wanted to push the boundaries and not sell anything. So the following year, um, you can see the picture on the left, we did the event, um, but we did it in the Louis Vuitton store. So imagine that. 
you're going shopping in Louis Vuitton in Soho, you're ready to put down five grand on, on an outfit or on a bag or something, and right next to you, behind a velvet rope, is a student cutting up the version of what you're just buying, or dyeing it, putting it in a bucket full of dye and dyeing it. It was amazing. It was really confounding people's expectations. It was making them think hard about what's going on? Why is this happening? And th that's what we want to do. We want to be provocative. So we did those two. The newest incarnation, which we're doing this year, is going to be amazing. We've got fashion students, music students, and dance students coming together. And so the fashion designers are creating outfits using Louis Vuitton samples for a performance which the dancers are going to do using the music that we create within the school. So it's, it doesn't happen anywhere else. It's, it's brand new. The man on the right is Prabal Gurung. Uh, anyone in, in fashion, I'm sure, is, is familiar with Prabal. Uh, he's Nepalese. Uh, he went to Parsons. He came to speak at our, uh, our fashion benefit. We have a huge gala event in May. Um, and it's a fundraiser. You know, and I'm sure many people in this room have been to fundraisers. You spend a lot of money on a table. You show up in a tuxedo. You sit there, listen to speeches. But for us, that doesn't work. That's boring. We don't do that. We don't do what other people do. We do a runway show, and you can see that on the left. But we do a runway show that people come in, and they see it, and they walk away like, what happened there? What was going on? How can there be like 150 looks? And each one of them was breathtaking. And the music's mixed live right there. And all these like, A-list celebrities are in the audience because they need to be seen to be there. It's a fantastic association for them to show up and see our show. So again, it's us stepping outside of what a traditional school does. Um, we bring our friends, the people that went to our school, back into Parsons because we want them to see what we're doing and we want people to be inspired. So we have a situation just like this. And we have, uh, you can see Proenza Schooler, they came in. Uh, you can see Derek Lamb and Jenna Lyons. Jenna Lyons is the president of J. Crew. She was at school with Derek Lamb. Derek Lamb's a very, very well-known designer. Um, you can see Isabel Toledo. Uh, she designed the outfit that uh, Michelle Obama wore uh, for inauguration. So uh, they come back in because they connect with our school. They want to know what's going on. The number of times I get people calling me up saying, what are you doing? How can I help? I want to be involved. Now, this is something that we take very seriously and we've really been pioneering. Zero waste. What zero waste means is creating a garment which doesn't produce any waste. And that sounds obvious. Right? That's what we all want. But anything that any of you are wearing that's of a woven material, jeans, sweaters, shirts, whatever it is, created waste. Usually about 15%, that's the average. And it just gets chucked away. And we don't think that's right. So we took it upon ourselves to educate the world about what zero waste means. This is a garment, the hoodie there, is, you can see the pattern lay for it next to it, produces zero waste. So we did a competition with, with our students. We worked with um, a New York City brand called Loom State, which is a pioneer in zero waste, and with Julie Gilhart, uh, who, had been the, who was the fashion director of Barney's New York. And we created a garment, our students created a garment that was zero waste but could be manufactured commercially. So you can see the, the, the garment on the top right. Now, it's one thing to do that uh, as a project and come up with a sample, but we needed to do it in a way that would be commercially viable. So we did. We made about 200 of them. Loom State made them. They sold them. All worked really nicely. But the point about it was that I want to go to the next step, the next step, which is 200,000 garments. So we're in, the, we're in the process now of working with a global retailer on how we take this concept and we use it to uh, create zero waste for products that they're already making. And the point I'm making here is that we're, not, we're a design school, but we don't just train fashion designers and then turn them out into the world and say, there you go. That wouldn't be enough. We're taking a lead. We're leading the industry. It's important to me that the industry comes to us and says, how do we do this? Now, that happens in the chemical industry and in medicine and things like that. We've all heard of the, the, the huge Pfizer or, or, or GlaxoSmithKline donating $100 million to a university to build a wing so they can study something that the corporation can then commercialize. It's very familiar territory in, in the sciences, but not in the arts. So that's what we're doing. The minute this project came out, on the left you can see the New York Times. We got the cover of the style section in the New York Times. You don't get that. Nobody gets that. So we got it. Um, and what happened thereafter was the whole world started coming to us whenever they had an idea for a sustainable project. And that's right. You know, I like to joke that when we're on the cover of the New York Times, all is right with the world. 
This is another example. Parsons is much more than a fashion school. We have architecture, interior design, design management, etc., photography, myriad other, anything to do with creative and, and design, we do. So this is a, it's called the Solar Decathlon. Um, and it's a competition every two years where engineering schools get together with design schools and they design a house, a sustainable house. And then they build them on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And uh, they get judged and then the winner gets a prize and then they take them to bits and take them home. So we did that. Um, and, but it wasn't enough for us to just enter the competition and exhibit a house. That was good. We could do that. We did it. We we're very happy. But what we also did was we found a family in the seventh ward, which some of you may know is the poorest uh, neighborhood in Washington, D.C., was total poverty. We found a family and we said, we're going to build this house in the seventh ward on a piece of land and we're going to give it to you. So instead of creating a house and then taking it to bits after the competition, we created a house, then we moved it and we gave it to somebody. And that's another place where Parsons is different to other places, other schools. This, you may be familiar with this brand, MCM a very well-known uh, Korean brand. We're, we're close with Sung Joo Kim, although slightly less so, given her political uh, actions at the moment. Um, but we, uh, we wanted to work with MCM, and we said, look, we don't want to design bags for you. You already have bags. We've got great designers. We don't need to help you with that. Why don't you let us embed technology in those bags? So this was about a year ago, and it was f fairly shortly after the tsunami that devastated Japan. And we had a Japanese student, and they were very affected by this. So um, the competition was take MCM products and embed technology in it. So he came up with a concept. You can see bottom left. Actually, bottom right is the, it's a bag, a lady's bag. But if you take out the lining of the bag, it's a gas mask. So you can see on the left someone wearing it as a gas mask, and that's the sketch on the top left. He also created a bag which had a flap, and you could take the flap off, unfold it, and it became a coat. And the coat was inflatable. So it was a flotation device. So he was responding to a need. And these were concepts. You know, they're not going to be commercialized by MCM. That's not their business. But they knew that it was exciting. They knew that it was a concept that could really generate interest, could inspire their designers. Um, and then a couple of other examples you can see on the top right. That bag, we all have grief from airlines when we're trying to fly for weighing this, weighing that. The bag is self-weighing. So you hold it in your hand. You can see how much it weighs. Just built in there. Just say no. So this is the campaign against bad design. If I see bad design, I say, no, I'm not doing it. I don't want it. You just give me that thing, I don't want it. It's bad design. Take it away from me. Don't buy any. I encourage people, please don't buy bad design. I'm, gonna, I'm usually quite controversial, but I know we're not in a country that uh, is a big fan of Apple necessarily. But I find PCs revolting. And I think Apple computers are beautiful. They're a thing of beauty. So if I look at the interface on this computer right here, it's not very nice. I don't like it. There's, a, there's a, a lot of buttons here. I don't know what they're for. I don't know what they do. There's another one here. It's like, it's, this is not an attractive piece of plastic. But if I look at a piece of Apple product, I love it. It's beautiful. I could show you my phone. And if I want to send a, a picture in my phone, I, I, I open the picture, and then I push send. And it kind of shrinks it, and then it expands it on the, the email. But it places it really gently. It's just a thing of beauty. Now, to me, that's right. That's what it should be. So I don't know why you, people don't want that. I don't understand. When someone holds an ugly thing, I'll be honest with you, like, this is an ugly thing right here. <laughs> I have to hold it because the gentleman just handed it to me and I need to use it. But this is ugly. I would never have this in my house or in my school. <laughs> so just saying no is very important. Um, we say no to a lot of people. Uh, recently, uh, a, a magazine came to us. Uh, a global magazine, very well-known fashion magazine, and they said, we love what you do. Uh, we would really love to work with you. We would like to give you the opportunity for your students to be showcased in our magazine. We'll build a website associated with our website so that the, everyone in the world can see what you do. And we'll give you a runway show during Fashion Week just to showcase your designers. And I said, that's a wonderful offer. That's really, really kind of you. No. And they're like, what? what do you mean no? How can you say no? I said, no, I'm really sorry. It's very kind of you, but I don't wish to be part of that project. And they said, why? And I said, because you had another school do it last year. And then you had another school the year before. So if you think that we're going to be third in line to two other schools, then you don't know who we are. We don't do that. We don't come third to anybody. And because we don't come third to anybody, Christian Louboutin rang us up. He said, 
I'm launching my 20-year anniversary shoe collection. I can't just show shoes. I need dresses. Can you help? So we said, of course we can. So we got our alumni together, and we designed five dresses to match his shoes, and we had a big party at Bergdorf Goodman, which some of you may know. It's like Shinsege in New York. So he came to us. So that's like the New York Times cover. All is right with the world when Christian Louboutin comes to us to do a project. And the reason he does that is because we say no to everybody else. The other people that have come to us recently include these. Now, this is kind of a who's who of what's important in the, well, the world of fashion. Here's some more. They come to us because they want to work with us. Now, we don't only work with the richest, with PPR and Gucci. We work with The Gap. We like The Gap. We think they're good. We work with Allen Edmonds. You may not know them. They're a classic American shoe company. But we believe in what they do. We respect them as brands, and so we're keen to work with them. And there are myriad other companies we said no to, but the power of saying no is vital. You have to do it. I mean, someone, I, I spoke at uh, Wharton Business School in, in the US recently, and this, one of the students said, oh, it's easy for you to say, you know, I don't want bad design, but what can I do about it? And I said, everyone can do something about it at all times. And if, if you're holding a pen right now, look at that pen and ask yourself if it's an attractive pen, or is it ugly? Is it just, was it cheap, or did someone give it to you? It's just a pen, who cares, you know, it's just writing with it. Well, I care. Don't use an ugly pen. I don't, I don't have any ugly pens. I don't. I don't encourage them. I don't want to see them. I don't have them. I don't send ugly emails either. I don't. I don't send ugly text messages. Where are you? Well, what is that? Can you not write? Do you know how to spell you? You know, I get the fact that teenagers write differently, and I accept that. We have to evolve. But there's a point where it becomes ugly, and, and we say no to that. We've done something recently which is a first for American design, and we're very proud of it. We launched an MFA program, a master's in fine art, in fashion design and society. The and society is very key there because fashion is more than just what you wear. The reason we did that was Donna Karen, who you can see on the left, came to us and said, why do I have to go to Europe to recruit my best designers? Why can I not get them from the US? And it's because there was no master's program. So we launched one. Um, they just graduated the first class after two years. Uh, and you can see uh, the two images in the middle are a competition that took place at the Met, the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, in the Costume Institute. I'm sure you all know of Alexander McQueen, and perhaps many of you heard of the exhibition last year called Savage Beauty. Uh, it was an exhibition of McQueen's work, and it was the most attended show the Met's ever had. They sold 60,000 copies of the hardback book just in their store, which is unheard of. So anyway, they did a competition. There were four finalists. It was open to all of the US. All four finalists came from Parsons. And I've only got 18 students. So of our 18 students, they won all four final places, which is good. I feel like all is right with the world. So we, know, we demonstrated our credentials in America. Then we went to Europe, because of course, I'm sure anyone that's familiar with fashion or design education knows there are some very good schools in Europe. Um, the names escape me. Uh, but there was a competition in Italy at, at, at Pitti Filati, which is the big yarn fair. Uh, we won all of that, too. So you can see the image on the right is the booth at Pitti Filati. Now, to those of you outside of the industry, this might not mean very much. But think about it this way. Anyone that's important in fashion goes to Florence twice a year to choose the yarn to make their garments. They go. And this booth is the most important one there. So anyone that's important in fashion goes to this booth. And the only garments they could see when they were there were from Parsons. And it was our first year of having the MFA program. Now, to me, going back to the beginning, when I said brilliance only, please, that's it. That's what we do. We don't do anything unless we win. We're not interested. If it's not our core competency, we don't do it. So it allows us to do whatever the hell we want. On the right, you'll see an exhibition of the MFA work. That was in London during London Fashion Week. They, they rang us up. And they said, we'd love to see what you're doing. We'll give you this house, this huge house in London. You can do whatever you want there, but please just come over and show us what you're doing. So we did. On the left, when our students graduated, we were thinking, how do we showcase what they do? What's the best way to do that? We could have done a runway show. Um, indeed, we did in September. But in May, when they graduated, we said to one of our friends, uh, a very large corporation, we want some space. So they gave us that space, 28,000 square feet. Um, in, of raw skyscraper. So it was wires hanging from the ceiling, raw concrete floor. It was beautiful. So we brought together our other friends to dress it up, to, to create an exhibition there. We built walls, we did installations, etc. And we created an event that no one's ever seen before. 
And that's what we do. We're in the business of things people have never seen. This was the response when we did our runway show. Um, so again, the New York Times was in the front row. They called our, our, uh, our show. The reaction was wildly enthusiastic. Style.com, which is Vogue, said it's conceptually rich. Women's Wear Daily, thoughtfulness, artistry, and intelligence. And even the French couldn't resist saying it was a kaleidoscope of experimentation. So again, these things happen, and all is right with the world. I've heard, um, I heard Churchill par par quoted and paraphrased yesterday and the day before, so I figured I had to do it today as well. Um, never, 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 never give in to bad design. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. If you go, go to a store, you need a pen, you need to buy a pen, they're all ugly, don't buy one. Just manage. Just get home and go and find one somewhere else. Don't buy an ugly notebook. Don't give in to it. If someone gives you something, no thanks. If you've got to, whatever you're involved in, don't do it. And you know something else? Don't, don't go somewhere and not care about what you're wearing. Because you are your own brand. You are at all times. Whatever you people are all wearing right now, that's a message you're sending out. And I do this to my students. I'm like, how are you sitting? And they've got students who sit like this. I'm like, that tells me the kind of person you are. There it is. You are your own brand. That's the image you're giving. And the way that you're dressing, that's you. And anyone that thinks that people don't judge by appearance is a fool, because everyone does. Create beautiful solutions. So this was the title of this speech, and it's so important. You can create a solution. You can fix whatever it is. You can do something. And that's all right. It'll work. But it doesn't make us better off, really. It's not what we want. You're not going to be successful. This thing here is a solution. It works. I can push this green button, and I'll go to the next slide. It works. But it's not very nice. My phone over there, I keep looking at my phone. I love my phone. It's, it's the thing of beauty. I like it. I like looking at it. I like holding it. This just works. So create a beautiful solution. And be nice. So this, this has got nothing to do with good design. But I put this in every presentation I do. Because to me, design is about, I said at the beginning, design is not about making nice clothes. Design is about everything that we do. Everywhere that we are. And so if... I, I don't draw pictures anymore. It's been many years since I drew pictures. But I create teams and I create projects. And I feel like a successful solution involves everyone being happy with what we've done. It involves going away. I hope you're all happy when you walk away from this, this talk this morning. Because I hope, I hope I'm nice. Like, I'm provocative and I like to ask difficult questions and I like to provoke people. But I, I, you've got to be nice about it. Like, the, the, the creating a beautiful solution is about making everyone happy. So being nice is like, that to me, that's part of good design. Uh, I, read, I only discovered this word a, a few years ago, and uh, it's really important. It's a great thing. Going back to the young lady at Wharton who had said to me, um, what can I do? Practis spezzatura. Uh, it's an Italian word. It was coined, um, it became popular about 100 years ago, uh, and it was for people like Oscar Wilde, people that were rich and idle and had nothing to do apart from be elegant in everything that they did. So if they were going to eat a sandwich, they would eat a sandwich elegantly. If they were going to stand on a street corner waiting for their friend, they would stand there elegantly. If they were going to drink, if they were going to dress, whatever they did, every facet of their life was conducted in the most elegant way they could think of. And to me, that too is an example of creating a beautiful solution, a beautiful solution to how you live your life. It's wonderful. I love it. It's like, it, it gives me joy. It gives me pleasure to think about an elegant way of of doing anything, of walking from the back of the room to the front. I, like everything we do, the way you sit, the way you arrange your coat. If I'm carrying my coat over my arm, I fold it appropriately because I care. I do. And if it's a really rough coat, if I'm wearing a denim jacket, then maybe I, care, maybe I want it to be carried a little bit less pristinely. And it's not that I'm obsessed with design. I mean, I am, of course, but it's not about that. It's about just design permeates everything, everything that we do. And so we have to acknowledge that and luxuriate. I was just having a conversation with someone this morning, um, and I was talking about the unfortunate nature of so many companies where they don't respect design. And this, this gentleman said to me, well, then they should have a chief design officer. And I said, yeah, but that's kind of a corporate solution. It's not about that. It's not about having someone in charge of design. It's about everybody embracing it, everyone understanding the importance of it. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't. You know, I... I I, I wasn't sure whether to mention it or not, but I think, look where we are. Look at this room. It's quite a big room. There's probably, what, 100 of us in here, maybe a bit more. Um, next door's bigger, and the other one on that side's bigger as well. 
and I don't know what they're talking about, but it's not design. So whoever put this conference together clearly felt that design was just a little bit less important than the other things. Just a little bit less. And um, yeah, we'll put it on the end. Yesterday, uh, I don't know who the guy was, he was giving a speech on Korean education, I mentioned it earlier, and he didn't mention design. Yeah, I guess it wasn't quite as important enough to him to mention. And he's wrong. And they're wrong. It's not, that's not how it goes. And you know what? Apple proved it. The most successful company in the world, the most, ex the most successful retail per square foot in the world, and they're obsessed with the design, and they're not cheap. Virgin Atlantic, another example. Brilliant airline. They're the only company. There's two companies flying. The most popular air, air route in the world is London, New York. There's only two companies flying today that are still in business from when Virgin started in the 80s, and that's Virgin and BA. Both of them obsessed with design and quality service. It's amazing. It's like, it's so obvious. I don't understand how people don't understand. So, to conclude, and I want you to remember these things because they're important. Um, it's about creating beautiful solutions. Brilliance only. Don't accept compromise. Don't. If you go out and you're looking for a jacket and you can't find the one you really want, don't buy one. Don't do it. Don't compromise. If you find one, you, nah, you don't really like the lining. Don't buy it. Don't. Wait. Get a better one. Just say no. Say no to bad design. Don't accept it. Never give in to bad design. Never, never, never give in. Create beautiful solutions. Be nice and practice spetsotora in everything that you do. Thank you. Simon Collins를 바라보는 것만으로도 굉장히 뉴욕 스타일의 인스피레이션 받아가지고 굉장히 즐거워지는 것 같습니다. 실은 강연해 주신 내용 중에 어, bad design과 good design을 굉장히 확연하게 구분하시는 어, perspective 그리고 반드시 팔리는 디자인이 조금 중요하다는 강조점, arts와 디자인의 어떤 구분과 어떤 음, 혹은 그 공통점들. 그런 여러 가지 부분에서 지극히 뉴욕적이고 그리고 팔슨스적인 디자인 가치관을 가지고 계신 것 같습니다. 어, 저도 실은 굉장히 뉴욕에서 공부하면서 팔슨스의 교육을 받으면서 이 디자인에 대한 이러한 굉장히 어, 사고관이나 가치관이 형성됐던 그런 기억들이 있습니다. 그리고 어, 강연 내용 중에 음악이라든지 하는 다양한 콜라보레이션을 통해서 인스피레이션을 받는 그런 교육을 보여주셨는데 학부 시절에 어, 재즈에서 영감을 받은 디자인을 하라는 선생님의 프로젝트를 받고 거의 한달 동안 재즈에 미친 듯이 몰두해서 살았던 그런 기억들도 나는 것 같습니다. 어, 이런 다양한 경험들을 바탕으로 해서 먼저 어, 성균관대학교의 이문혁 교수님께서 내용에 대해서 조금 디스커션 해주시고 그리고 사이먼 콜린스 학장님께 어, 질문을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 예, 안녕하세요. 성균관대학교 이문혁입니다. 어, 저는 한국에서 의류학 전국으로 대학을 졸업한 직후에 팔슨스에 가서 두 번째 학사 과정을 마쳤고요. 또 졸업한 후에는 지금 한 13년째 교육 분야에 종사를 해오고 있습니다. 그러면서 계속 고유, 교육 과정에 대한 고민을 해왔고 또 팔슨스 커리큘럼에 대해서 그 변화에 대해서 꾸준히 관심을 가지고 보면서 또제 교육에도 적용을 해오고 있습니다. 저는 어, 팔슨스에서 경험을 간단하게 한세 가지 정도로 요약을 해서 말씀드리고자 합니다. 어, 첫 번째는 그 체계적인 커리큘럼입니다. 다른 유수의 디자인 스쿨도 다 그렇지만 팔슨스도 엄청난 과제량으로 유명한 곳입니다. 그런데 과제가 많다는 것이 중요한 것이 아니라 매우 체계적이고 치밀한 커리큘럼 하에서 학생들의 잠재력을 최대한 발굴해주는 프로그램이라고 생각이 됩니다. 제가 학교 다닐 때 친구들하고 종종 했던 말 중에 하나가 여기는 우리의 능력의 120%를 요구하는 데 같다. 그런 말 많이 했었습니다. 굉장히 힘들다는 뜻이죠. 
그래서 제가 돌아와서 그 사디라는 지금 김승현 교수님이 계신 사디라는 곳에서 한 9년 정도 강의를 했었는데요. 그때는 이제 팔슨스와 그 사디가 어필리에이션 관계 있었기 때문에 어, 팔슨스 커리큘럼을 직접 볼 수가 있었습니다. 그런데 굉장히 놀랬던 점은 그, 그 과목당 실라버스가 거의 책한 권에 가깝고요. 그뭐 예를 들어서 교, 수업 첫 시간에 하는 개요만 세 페이지입니다. 그렇게 자세하게 다 기록이 돼 있고 뭐 드로잉 시간에는 어떤 옷을 입혀서 무슨 포즈로 몇 분짜리를 몇 개를 해라 이런 것이 다 일일이 기록이 되는 걸 봤을 때 어떤 인스트럭터가 가르치더라도 학생들이 전달받는 내용에는 큰 차이가 없도록 하는 목적이었겠구나 이렇게 생각이 들었습니다. 그리고 그 과, 과, 과목 뿐만이 아니라 과목 간의 연계도 굉장히 치밀하게 돼 있고 학기 간 학년 간의 연계도 돼 있어서 교육 효과를 극대화하는 것을 볼 수가 있었습니다. 예를 들어서 뭐 쉽게 예를 들면 이번 주에 뭐 니트다 그러면 드로잉 시간에 니트를 입은 모델을 그리고 디자인 시간에는 니트 디자인을 하고 그걸 드레이핑 시간에는 그걸 가지고 옷을 만들어 보고 뭐 디지털 시간에는 니트 도직을 만들어 본다든가 이런 식으로 연계가 돼 있었습니다. 두 번째는 아까 사이먼 얘기에서 나왔었는데 굉장히 학제 간 연계가 인터 디서플리너리한 연계가 가능한 환경입니다. 그 뉴스쿨 안에는 그 팔슨스라는 디자인 스쿨 외에도 무슨 재즈 스쿨이나 무용, 뭐 액팅이나 다 소속이 돼 있기 때문에 그런 뉴욕이라는 환경 안에서 각 전공의 사람들이 다 모여서 충분히 재미있는 프로젝트를 많이 할수 있고 또 최근에는 더 그런 걸 학교에서 장려하고 있는 것 같습니다. 세 번째는 프로페셔널리즘인데요. 제가 말하는 프로페셔널리즘은 진지함과 자신감입니다. 그 진지함의 예는 제가 저는 여기서 조, 대학을 졸업하고 갔기 때문에 이제 어느 정도 낯설지 않은 환경이었지만 그 음, 저한테 신선하게 다가갔던 것은 제가 2학년 때그 4학년 졸업 작품전을 위한 피팅, 그러니까 졸업 작품전 가봉을 하는. 과정을 참관을 하게 됐는데 제가 예상하는 장면은 뭐였냐면 학생들이 보통 피팅 전에는 며칠 밤 밤을 새고 오기 때문에 굉장히 어수선하고 그다음에 일부 마무리 못한 학생들은 막 작업을 하고 있을 거다 이렇게 생각을 하고 갔는데 전 학생들이 다 착석을 하고 있었고요 매우 조용했고 그다음에 그 크리틱으로 온 외부 디자이너 작품 디조를 도와준 외부 디자이너는 랑 학생이랑 얘기하는 동안에 그 내용을 교수는 막 직접 적어주고 그 다음에 뭐 드레이핑 교수님은 직접 막 바닥에 쭈그려 앉아서 피팅을 도와주고 다음 사람만 조용히 나가서 준비를 하는 그런 과, 광경이었습니다. 그래서 엄격하게 그 듀데이트 관리나 그런 그 학생 관리를 철저히 하기 때문에 그런 그 장면이 가능했다고 생각이 들고요. 그런 환경은 졸업하고 나서 사회생활을 할 때도 스스로에게 엄격하게 할수 있는 그 틀이 되었습니다. 어 그리고 또그 자신감은요. 아까 사이먼의 그 스피치도 굉장히 자신감이 넘쳤죠. 제가 저는 한국에서 오래 공부를 하다 가서 굉장히 충격이었는데 선생님들이 어, 우리는 최고고 너희들은 최고고 막 그, 그렇게 얘기를 막 해주는 거예요. 그래서 처음에는 어떻게 저렇게 말을 할수 있을까 했는데 너무나 그게 그 학교 생활하면서 자신감이 자연스럽게 몸에 뱉던 것 같습니다. 그 학생들이 저에게 이제 지금 학생들이 저에게 팔슨스의 경험에 대해서 가끔 물어보는데요. 어땠냐고 이렇게 물어볼 때 저는 제가 배운 가장 소중한 것은 디자인 능력보다는 그 좋아하는 일을 하면 굉장히 힘들고 고통스러운 것도 기꺼이 해야 되고 나아가서 즐길 수 있다는 것이다 그렇게 얘기를 합니다. 제가 이제 팔슨스에 가서 첫 1년간은 굉장히 힘들었어요. 너무 많은 과제량을 주는 데다가 그렇기 때문에 매주 그 어떤 이번 주에는 얼마나 많은 숙제를 줄까에 대해서 좀 두려움이 컸는데 한 1년 정도 지나고 나니까 제 태도가 바뀌는 걸 느끼게 됐습니다. 그러니까 선생님이 이제 수업이 끝날 부분에 다 이번 주 과제를 말씀해 주실 때막 심장이 뜁니다. 너무 좋아서 너무 기대되고 이번에 어떤 어사인먼트를 주실까 그러면 그 말을 하자마자 머릿속에 어떤 소재로 무슨 디자인을 해야겠다는 속이 꽉 차게 되고 수업이 끝나자마자 원단 시장이나 뭐 시장 조사를 하러 가거나 도서관을 달려갔던 기억이 납니다. 그래서 그런 경험이 아직도 제가 교육을 하는 데 있어서 그 원동력이 되는 것 같습니다. 어, 전 지금 성균관대에서 근무를 하면서 어, 디자인 실무뿐만 아니라 이제 이론에도 집중을 하고 있는데요. 제가 요즘에 느끼는 거는 그 강도 높은 디자인 경험도 물론 중요하지만 그 패션 현상을 미적으로 또 사회적 학적으로 통찰하는 관점을 가지는 것도 참 중요하다고 생각합니다. 다행히도 지금 팔슨스에서 많이 강조하고 있는 부분이기도 하고요. 
그래서 패션을 통해서 새로운 디자인뿐만이 아니라 새로운 개념을 제시하는 인재가 필요하다고 생각이 들고 그 팔신스가 그 중심에 있기를 바랍니다. 감사합니다. 어, 이문혁 선생님이 교수님께서 하신 말 중에 굉장히 마음에 와닿는 말이 그 자기가 좋아하는 일을 한다는 그런 부분과 그리고 디자인과 관련된 작업을 하는 사람으로서의 자기 스스로에 대한 어떤 자부심, 프라이드 같은 것들이 어, 굉장히 마음에 와닿는 부분이었던 것 같습니다. 혹시 어, 이문혁 선생님 최근에 팔슨스 같은 경우에는 사이먼 컬린스가 학장이 되면서 굉장히 많은 어, 학제적인 개편이 있었다고 들었습니다. 그래서 어, 예를 들면 디자인과 소사이어티를 좀더 연결한다는 의미에서 그리고 콜래버레이션적인 어떤 작업을 학교 내에서 보다는 좀더 확대해서 어떤 비즈니스나 미디어나 굉장히 다양한 사회 분야들과 함께 한다는 부분들 혹은 서스테이너빌리티나 테크놀로지에 대한 어, 어떤 디자인적 측면에서의 관심들에 어, 중심을 둔 개편이 많이 이루어졌다고 했는데 관련해서 혹시 어, 사이먼 컬린스 학장에게 질문 있으시면 예, 그, 지금 그, 하 교수님 말씀하신 대로 그 MFA 과정이 신설되면서 그런 새로운 변화가 있었던 거, 그 다음에 그 학부 과정에서도 졸업작품 전에 그 thesis가 포함이 돼서 뭔가 라이팅을 하게 하고 개념적으로 생각하는 걸 장려하는 것 같은데 그런 변화에 대해서 자체적으로는 어떻게 평가하시는지 궁금합니다. 아, sorry about the delay. I was waiting for the translation. Um, <clears throat> so things have evolved in our school, and it would be criminal if we weren't evolving. Uh, we teach the basics, we do, and we'll always teach the basics. You have to. You have to learn how to make clothing. You have to learn how to design. You have to learn how to do a project, how to complete on deadline, etc. <clears throat> and it used to be that we taught people to do that, and then they graduated, and then they had to spend time learning to be entrepreneurial and learning how to use the tools that we'd given them. Now that's fine, that worked brilliantly. It worked for Donna Karen, it worked for Mark Jacobs, it worked for Proenza Schola, it, it does work. But we felt that our students were being more innovative earlier on in their process. I remember very well uh, being shown, in my first year at Parsons, being shown uh, some students who uh, had got together. The project they'd been given was to design a collection of menswear. And it was three guys, and all they needed to do was 20 sketches, and that was it. So they said, yeah, we'll do the 20 sketches, but they'd also made the clothing. There was no reason for them to do that, but they knew it was important, so they did it. And they'd made the labels to go in the back. They'd come up with a brand. And they'd made the hang tags. And they'd made a, a, a magazine advert. And they'd made a short video commercial for their brand. And they'd even taken a picture of Times Square and Photoshopped their advert onto a billboard in Times Square. Now, I could see this happening. I could see the students doing this. And the curriculum was simply giving them the tools, not necessarily giving them the space to experiment with those tools. So what we've done, and it's been quite controversial, but what we've done is we've opened up the curriculum. We've said to students, it used to be you had to design 150 sketches, and they had to be colored in exactly the same size, and you just churned them out. I'm sure this is what it was like when you were there. You just did them every week. And so when you graduated, you could do sketches like that. It was brilliant. Well, now, that's an option if you want to do it. But if you want to do all of your work on the computer, that's OK. And if you want to photograph things and draw on the photographs, or if you want to make garments, that's OK too. We've, brace it, we've opened ourselves up to a way to encourage the best designers to work in whatever way they think is important. We think it's, it's critically important to do this. It's really living what we teach. And so in that sense, it really has evolved. 네, 감사합니다. 어, 실은 어, 저희 서울대학교에서도 마찬가지고 국내에서 교육을 하는 곳이라면 어디든지 항상 교과 과정에 대한 고민들을 끊임없이 하고 있습니다. 어, 하지만 제가 느끼기에 팔슨스에서 갖는 많은 변화들은 실은 내부적으로 변화를 하고 싶어도 혹은 변화에 대한 필요성을 느껴도 조금 용기가 없어서 혹은 이제까지 지속되던 어떤 시스템에 안정되어서 편안해서 바꾸지 못하는 경우 혹은 이렇게 급작스러운 변화를 가져오지 못하는 경우들이 굉장히 많이 있습니다. 내부적으로 많은 논란이 있고 뭔가 문제점들이 발견될지언정 어떤 새로운 이렇게 변화나 개혁을 위한 시도를 하고 그것들을 실천해 나가고 있다는 점에서 굉장히 어, 감사하고 감동받게 생각하는 부분이라고 생각이 됩니다. Actually, let me add one other thing. Um, I, I'm the dean of the School of Fashion at Parsons. 
it's Parsons is one of the most prestigious design schools in the world. I, when I started my job as dean, I hadn't done one day in the, in the academy. I hadn't got a single day of experience as a teacher, none, nothing. And I find it very hard to imagine any other prestigious university letting their biggest and most important school be taken over by somebody with zero experience. And to me, that's a symptom of what's great about my school, about Parsons. They knew they wanted somebody from the industry who understood academia and could lead it, but didn't necessarily have any experience. And so they did it. And I think that is an example of how we as a school have evolved and why we're lucky enough to be a leader in, in what we do. 네, 어, 부연 설명해 주셨는데 실제로 저도 어, 딘이 되셨을 때 어, 저희 어, 알람나이들 뉴욕에서 활동하고 있는 동문들에게 어, 굉장히 시끄럽다, 뭐 굉장히 충격적이다 혹은 어, 가능 이런 개혁들이 과연 긍정적일까 하는 질문들이나 혹은 얘기들을 많이 듣고 많이 걱정스러운 눈으로 어, 그 변화를 지켜봤던 사람들이 꽤 있었던 걸로 알고 있습니다. 네, 하지만 어, 이렇게 시간이 지나면서 이제 벌써 한 4년여가 지나고 있으면서 어, 많은 변화와 함께 어, 긍정적인 평가를 받는다고 알고 있습니다. 네, 감사합니다. 다음에 다음으로는 그러면 지금 삼성 아트앤 디자인 인스티튜트에서 어, 가르치고 계신 김승현 선생님의 어, 의견과 함께 궁금한 점들의 질문을 들어보도록 하겠습니다. 안녕하세요. 저는 삼성 디자인 학교 패션 디자인 학과 교수 김승현입니다. 아, 저도 이문혁 선생님과 같이 아, 저는 사실은 전공을 팔슨스에 가기 전에 버클리 대학교에서 건축을 전공했습니다. 그리고 나서 너무 패션이 해보고 싶다는 생각이 들었는데 어, 그때 당시 지금도 팔슨스는 세계 최고의 학교지만 1995년 그때 당시에 팔슨스 외에 다른 디자인 학교를 상상할 수 없을 정도로 팔슨스의 위상은 대단했던 것 같습니다. 어, 그래서 어, 팔센스에서 제 꿈을 실현하기 위해서 열심히 공부를 했고요. 어, 그 이후로 저는 팔센스 졸업한 후로 미국에서 디자이너로 활동을 했습니다. 그래서 바나나 리퍼블릭, 뭐 마이클 콜스, 그 다음에 앤 테일러와 같은 그런 디자인 기업에서 뉴욕에서 활동을 했고요. 현재는 그 이후 한국으로 들어와서 삼성 디자인 학교에서 어, 글로벌 인재 양성을 위해서 지금 디자인 교육을 하고 있습니다. 어, 아시다시피 삼성은 어, 삼성 디자인 학교는 1995년에 팔슨스와 제휴 관계를 맺고 교육을 시작합니다. 그래서 팔슨스의 우수한 커리큘럼을 기반으로 해서 어, 삼, 한국에서도 글로벌 인재를 양성하고자 디자인 교육을 어, 시작하는 것을 목표로 설립되었습니다. 뭐 2012년 현재는 제휴 관계가 마무리됐지만 아직도 교수님이 아까도 말씀하셨던 기본적인 팔스 커리큘럼의 기초는 유지하고 있으며 또이 시대에 맞게 또는 한국이라는 지역적 특성에 맞게 변화하면서 커리큘럼을 개선해 나가고 있습니다. 어, 저는 어, 팔스 교육의 우수성에 대해서 제가 느끼고 경험했던 우수성에 대해서 간단하게 말씀을 드리고 그 다음에 저의 교육 경험, 한국에서의 교육 경험에 대해서 간단하게 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 저는 팔슨스도 피로 시작하는데 팔슨스의 장점을 세 가지 P, 3P로 말씀드릴 수 있을 것 같습니다. 첫 번째 P는 플레이스입니다. 어, 세계의 문화와 예술, 경제의 중심지인 뉴욕의 한 중심에 팔슨스가 위치하고 있다는 것이 팔슨스의 큰 경쟁력이라고 저는 생각합니다. 다양한 문화를 경험할 수 있고 또 세계 제일의 디자인 산업과 같은 위치에 있다는 것이 팔슨스의 큰 경쟁력입니다. 어, 디자인 산업체와 한 지역에서 어우러져 디자인 트렌드 및 감성을 어디 가서 수업에서 공부하는 것이 아니라 직접 몸소 일상에서 체험할 수 있다는 것이 아주 큰 경쟁력이라고 생각합니다. 저 역시 학교 갔다 왔다 하는 중간에 다나 캐렌이랑 마주치기도 하고 마크 제이콥스와 한군 한뭐한 뭐한 카페에서 같이 커피를 마신 적도 있는 것 같습니다. 같이 마시진 않았지만 몸소 체험할 수 있는 그런 지역적 특성이 있었던 것 같습니다. 예. <웃음> 아이, 예, 그렇지만 마이클 콜스와는 많이 마셨고요. 같이 출장도 다녔습니다. 그래서 산업과 밀접한 또 협력 관계를 유지할 수 있습니다. 따라서 학교에서 뭐가 필요했을 때 교수님이 마이클 콜스에 가서 뭐뭐를 좀 배워오거라 또는 어, 마이클 콜스를 초청해서 어, 
강의를 듣기도 하고 크리틱으로 초청하시기도 하는 그런 밀접한 관계가 팔슨스의 대단한 경쟁력이라고 생각합니다. 첫 번째 지역적 특성에 대해서 말씀드렸고요. 두 번째 피는 피뿔이라고 생각합니다. 그래서 팔슨스는 어, 한국의 교육 문화와는 약간 다르게 미국에 위치하고 있고 세계 최고의 디자인 학교이기 때문에 팔슨스의 40에서 50% 이상이 외국인 학생으로 구성되어 있습니다. 저희가 직접 인도에 가지 않아도 인도에서 자라고 배운 학생들에게 그런 문화적 경험을 같이 간접적으로 체험할 수 있다는 것이 어, 대단한 경쟁력이었고요. 어, 서로 간접적인 영향을 끼치면서 토론하고 공부하면서 그곳에 가지 않아도 습득할 수 있던 대단한 경쟁력이 있었던 것 같습니다. 어, 또 하나 그 같이 공부하는 학생들 외에도 아까 보여주셨는데 팔순수의 얼룸나이 졸업생들의 어, 위상은 대단합니다. 어, 아까 전에 뭐 굉장히 많은 분들을 보여줬는데 마이클 코스 마크 어, 마이클 코스는 죄송합니다 아닙니다. 마크 제이콥스, 다나 캐렌, 그다음에 지금까지 활동하는 프렌차 스쿨러 어, 프라발 구룽, 뭐 알렉산더 왕등 굉장히 많은 훌륭한 얼럼나이들을 가지고 있습니다. 어, 제가 학교 다닐 때 인턴십을 나갔을 때도 팔슨스의 졸업생들이 너무 많았기 때문에 유대 관계를 느낄 수 있었고 학교 교육에 대해서도 많은 어, 토론을 할수 있었던 것 같습니다. 어, 세 번째 피는 프로세스입니다. 팔슨스는 아시다시피 100년 이상의 전통을 가지고 있습니다. 패션 학과, 패션 디자인 교육한 지도 106년이 된 걸로 저는 알고 있고요. 그래서 이러한 오랜 전통을 가지고 오랜 역사를 가지고 검증된 팔슨스의 교육 과정은 과히 어떤 학교도 따라갈 수 없을 정도로 체계적이라고 임교, 임문학 교수님이 말씀하신 것처럼 생각합니다. 어, 기초적으로 어, 뉴욕의 특성을 찾아서 차, 창조적이나 현실성 있는 디자인 아트적이나 상업적인 디자인을 추구하는 커리큘럼 그리고 또 디자이너가 기초적으로 배워야 할 전반적인 대한 어, 기초 지식은 파운데이션 코스 1학년에서 배웠던 것 같습니다. 그래서 기초 과정의 탄탄함, 그 다음에 전공 과정의 실무와 어, 실무와 창의성을 같이 배울 수 있는 교육 프로그램은 어, 졸업 후에도 너무나 실무를 활동할 때도 너무나 많은 도움이 되었던 것 같습니다. 그래서 뭐 다른 학교 학생들과 다르게 팔슨스 제가 졸업하고 어 산업으로 바로 들어갔을 때도 괴리감을 느끼지 않고 바로 현업에 어 맞는 그런 어 직무를 맡을 수 있었던 것은 팔슨스의 체계적인 교육 때문이었다고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 이렇게 세 가지를 말씀드렸는데요. 디자이너의 기초 소양을 기울, 기를 수 있는 파운데이션 프로그램과 또 창조성, 현실성을 동시에 습득할 수 있도록 구축되어 있는 커리큘럼 그리고 세계적인 디자이너와 협력 프로그램은 팔슨스를 최고의 교육기관으로 지속시킬 수 있게 해준다고 저는 생각을 합니다. 어, 그러면 저, 제가 경험한 한국에서의 교육의 경험에 대해서 말씀해 드리고 싶습니다. 어, 한국에서의 디자인 교육은 아시다시피 어, 한국이 위, 지역적 위치상 세계 패션의 중심은 아닙니다. 그렇기 때문에 저희가 교육을 팔슨스의 커리큘럼을 그대로 가져오고 왔다고 해도 그것을 100% 활용할 수는 없다고 생각하는 부분이 있습니다. 그래서 하, 어, 저뿐만 아니라 한국에서 패션을 교육하고 있는 많은 교수님들이 추구하고 있는 방법은 해외에 많은 교육기가, 교육기관, 뭐 팔슨스와 같은 미국의 교육기관 또는 유럽의 우수한 교육기관들과 어, 과 어, 협력 관계를 유지하면서 워크샵 등을 유치합니다. 한국의 많은 학생들, 디자인을 꿈꾸는 학생들 모두가 외국에 나가서 경험을 할수 있을 만한 그런 경제적인 능력은 되지 않습니다. 그래서 저희들이 교육하고 저희들이 계획하고 추진하고 있는 것은 우리가 가서 경험할 수 없다면 좀 모셔오거나 저희가 프로그램을 워크샵을 통해서 학생들에게 간접적으로나마 경험할 수 있도록 그런 것을 어, 많은 교류를 추진을 하고 있습니다. 어, 또한 가지 현재까지 사실은 한국은 단일 민족 저희 학교에서 사실은 외국인 학생들을 통한 다문화 교육을 기대하기는 어려운 부분이 있습니다. 그렇지만 이 부분 역시 어, 교육기관이 좀더 발전이 돼서 좀더 해외에 알려지는 교육기관이 된다면 조금 더 외국 학생의 유치에도 어, 기대를 가져볼 만하다고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 역시 그 부분 부족하지만 지속적으로 저희 교육자들이 추진해야 될 과제라고 생각을 합니다. 
그래서 마지막으로 어, 제가 생각하기에 교육은 강의실에서만 수업에, 수업으로만 이루어지는 것은 아니라고 생각합니다. 어, 저는 파슨스의 뭐 지역적 특성, 그다음에 다문화 배경의 인재, 그다음에 우수한 커리큘럼이 함께 어우러, 어우러져야만 우수한 결과물을 만들 수 있다고 생각을 하고요. 오늘 사이먼 콜린스 교수님의 말씀을 듣고 변화하는 부분에 대한 얘기를 들으니 팔슨스가 앞으로도 지속적으로 세계 최고의 대학으로 정말 남을 수 있겠다는 희망을 가지게 됩니다. 어, 그래서 저는 여기까지 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 네, 어, 김승현 선생님 감사합니다. 어, 특히 말씀하신 것 중에 저도 굉장히 마음에 와닿는 게그 피플이라는 측면인 것 같습니다. 어, 일단은 제, 저 자신도 같이 클라스에서 공부했던 같이 너무 많은 숙제에 같이 눈물을 흘리던 인도 여학생이나 혹은 일본 여학생들하고 아직도 지금 아주머니가 된 상태에서도 연락하면서 그쪽의 얘기들도 듣고 뭐 방문할 기회가 있으면 굉장히 절친한 친구로 지내고 있는 걸 봤을 때그 어 당시 팔슨스라는 학교에 같은 관심을 가지고 패션에 대한 열정을 가지고 함께 모였던 어, 친구들하고 만들어 나가는 세계적인 네트워킹의 부분은 굉장히 의미 있었던 것 같고요. 그리고 두 번째는 한국에서 학생들을 가르치면서 굉장히 안타까운 부분들이 어, 선배 디자이너들 혹은 음, 유명한 디자이너분들이 학교에 보여주는 어떤 애정과 관심의 부족에 굉장히 슬플 때가 많이 있습니다. 그런데 팔슨스를 졸업한 많은 어, 디자이너들이 자신의 재능 기부의 측면에서 혹은 신선한 아이디어를 어, 얻기 위해서 어, 긴밀하게 학교와 자기가 졸업한 학교와 관계를 유지하고 에너지를 투자하고 학생들에게 시간을 쏟는 것을 봤을 때 정말로 어, 부러움을 금할 수가 없었습니다. 그리고 팔슨스 주변에 있는 많은 페이브릭 스토어에서 학생들에게 나눠지는 스와치에 대한 그 조그마한 천 조각에 대한 그그 여유로움, 제너러스함이 항상 마음에 많이 남아 있고 그때 여기 한국에서는 학생들한테 뭐 동대문 시장 가서 스와치 받아오라고 하면 굉장히 어렵다, 다들 무시한다, 학생인 거 들키지 않으려고 거짓말해야 된다 굉장히 다양한 컴플레인이 들리거든요. 그런데 그쪽에서는 이제 미래의 고객들 나아가서 디자이너 활동을 하게 되면 결국은 자기 가게의 고객이 될 사람으로 학생들을 보면서 굉장히 많은 도움을 주고 있는 것을 아직도 생생하게 기억하고 있습니다. 혹시 관련해서 김승현 선생님 한국에서 교육과 경험을 봤을 때 조금 학장님께 질문하고 싶은 게 있으시면 부탁드립니다. 예. 어, 아까 피플 쪽에서 저는 질문을 드리고 싶습니다. 팔센스에서 어, 팔센스의 학생의 40에서 50% 이상이 외국인 학생으로 구성되어 있습니다. 그 중에서도 동양 학생의 비율이 굉장히 높은 걸로 나타나고 있는데요. 아까 전에 보여주신 성공한 디자이너들의 예시에서 세 분이 한국 분이셨던 걸로 기억을 합니다. 정두리 씨, 그다음에 리차드 채, 그다음에 어, 이서연 씨가 있었는데. 어, 정두리 씨와 리차드 채 씨는 사실은 한국에서 자란 문화적 배경을 가진 디자이너가 아닌 외국 교포, 미국의 교포로 알고 있습니다. 그렇다면 제가 드리고 싶은 질문은 한국이나 동양권의 문화적 배경을 지닌 학생들이 글로벌 디자이너로 성장하는데 어떤 경쟁력을 가져야 될 것인지 교수님의 의견을 듣고 싶습니다. One of the things that I find uh, traveling around the world, <clears throat> and actually you alluded to it at the beginning, uh, is the different responses I get from uh, different audiences. So for instance, uh, I taught a workshop in Beijing uh, a little while ago, uh, and I sat around a table with a bunch of students, um, and I, at the end of my, my conversation, I said, so what do we think? And they sat there like this. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, but it's probably going to be the case in, in Korea to an extent. And I understand there's a culture of respect for one's elders, um, and, you know, not questioning somebody. I mean, I'm the dean of the school, so people think twice before they question me. But actually, it doesn't work if you don't question me. It doesn't work. It's no good. I'm not even interested, frankly. If people don't ask me questions, I'm bored. So, and that's what I say at school. And I'm very provocative at school. When I'm speaking to a group like this in my school, I'm like, you better ask me good questions, otherwise I will come into the audience and I will choose one of you and I will make you ask me a question. And of course, that scares them to death, so they, they come up with something. The point I'm making is that um, we don't, I don't identify any of my students by where they're from. 
I don't see, I'm completely blind to anyone's country of origin, their nationality, anything. I just see people that want to be designers. And so you know, there was a, a little while ago, the New York Times uh, had me, interviewed me for an article on the rise of Asian or American-born Asian designers. Um, and I didn't really have much to offer because if you go back to the slide I showed, there's actually 21 designers on that of which 10 are of Asian descent, either having bo been born in Asia or, or, or in the US. But I don't see it that way. And I don't think that there's anything that anyone from somewhere in Asia, be it Korea, China, Japan, or, or anywhere else, brings that is significant because of their nationality compared to a European or a South American or an African. However, we do encourage students to embrace everything that made them, everything about where they're from, whether they're from Milwaukee or Mozambique or, or Kuala Lumpur or Seoul. You know, we ask them, look at where you come from. Look at what made you into the person that you are. Reach inside you for your vision, whatever that is. And if your vision happens to be one that's influenced by Korea, brilliant. We love that. We'll give you the tools in order to, for you to express that. But if you, also, if you're from Korea and nothing about what you do is in any way Korean, that's fine too. Richard Chai's collection, there's nothing about that that's in any way Korean. He's Korean. I think he was probably born in the US, but his parents were born in Korea. So, but... Uh, you know, it kind of leads to the, a question that I'm often asked, which is how do you create a Chinese global brand or a Korean global brand or a whatever it is, global brand? And the answer is forget about where you're from. Forget about being Chinese. You can ask me how do you create a global brand, and I, I, I can talk to you about that, but if the minute you put your nationality in front of that, it's all over. Because nobody wants to look Korean apart from Korean people. They don't. Nobody wants to look Chinese apart from Chinese people. The, the exceptions are Italians and Americans, and to an extent, the English, although that's rather waned. You know, Ralph Lauren exists because it's a very American look, and people quite like the idea of that. But frankly, un unless there's a flag on it, it doesn't really look American anymore. I mean, most of the people in this room are wearing clothes that could have come from Ralph Lauren. But that doesn't mean you look American. You don't. We just kind of look Western in a, in a general sense. So what I'm getting at here is... is my reluctance and the school's sort of refusal to really accept notions of nationality. We believe in pure quality design, and that can be from anywhere. And we're very proud. I mean, the, the statistic about how, how many international students we have, we're fiercely proud of that. We wouldn't be the school that we are if we were all Americans. I wouldn't want to go there, frankly. It, it would be boring. We are an incredibly rich school culturally, because people come from all over the world. And to me, I'm an Englishman. I've worked in the US, the UK, Italy, Hong Kong. So, but to me, that's just normal. I'm honestly, I'm much more comfortable in this room with all of you than I would be if I was in Wisconsin, in the middle of America. I have no idea where that is. I have no desire to go there. I'm sure it's lovely, but I don't really want to go there. There's too many white people. So to me and to our school, global and multicultural is just normal. We don't see it. We don't, it's just normal, it's what we do. And so, you know, we're, we're very proud of our international makeup, and I think that's what makes us the rich school that we are, and makes the Parsons experience such a rich one. Now, I don't know if that answered your question, but those are some thoughts around it. One 기본은 변하지 않는 기본은 지킨다는 말씀을 하셨던 것 같습니다. 그럼 패션 교육에 있어서 교수님이 생각하시는 기본은 그거는 어떤 것일까요? I think um, when I my own career, I went to fashion school and I learned to make clothes. And for the first two or three years of my career, I had a studio and I would get a piece of fabric and I would get a customer in and I'd say, "What do you want?" And I would design something for them. And then I would sit at a sewing machine and I would make that garment. Now, to me, that's the basics. I know how to make this suit. I haven't picked up a sewing machine or a pencil in 15 years, probably, but I know how to make a suit. And to me, that's mastering the basics. So if I'm going to design something, or if one of my students is going to design something, they're going to know how to make that garment. And I don't care that they'll never sew another garment in their life. It doesn't, that doesn't interest me. I care that they know how to sew a garment. Because there's nothing. I'm sure we've all found this in our respective careers. There's nothing worse than someone telling you what to do who doesn't really know what you're doing. So as a creative director, when I told someone, no, I need more of this and less of that, it's because I know how to do it. I'm speaking from a position of experience. And frankly, going back to uh, the rather controversial move of Parsons to hire me, you know, I said, 
If I wrote a list of all the things I know how to do, most of them are what you need at school. Most of them, bringing teams together. I've been educating designers my whole career because I've always had people reporting to me. I know how to do that. I know how to get the best out of people. I know how to encourage people to do what they want, to, to indulge their passion and, and communicate that. I know how to do that. I know how to bring people together around a table and get them to work together in a constructive way. I know how to do that. And this is what I do day in, day out. So um, I kind of wandered off from the question. I always do that. I talk too much as well. <laughs> but I don't know if that helps. 네, 감사합니다. 실은 어, 최근에 저희 대학도 어, 교과 과정 개편에 대한 많은 논의를 하고 있는데 변화가는 사회에 발맞춰서 굉장히 새롭게 요구되는 것들에 대해서 관심을 굉장히 많이 가지고 어떻게 그것들을 향해서 갈 것이냐로만 고민을 했는데 진짜 크게 잊고 있었던 것이 그 베이직에 대한 부분인 것 같습니다. 옷을 다루는 사람으로서 반드시 알아야 될 것들 위에 더 많은 비전을 얹어줄 수 있는 그런 교과 과정을 개편해야겠다는 생각을 다시 한번 해봤습니다. 그리고 아까 에이지언 학생들이나 이제 중국 오디언스에 대한 언급을 하셨는데 어, 뉴욕에 처음 갔을 때 저는 평생 자라면서 겸손이 미덕이라고 배우면서 자랐습니다. 남들 앞에서 잘난 채를 한다든지 나를 좀 봐달라고 손을 흔든다든지 하는 건 상상도 못했었는데 그걸로 인한 좌절이 굉장히 많았던 것 같습니다. 근데 그때 어, 굉장히 친한 미국인 친구가 어드바이스 해주기를 네가 아프다고 말안 하면 아무도 아픈 걸 모른다. 네가 날 봐달라고 얘기하지 않으면 그 사람은 널 봐주지 않는다. 라고 하면서 네가 나를 봐달라고 소리 질러야지만 네가 눈길을 받을 수 있다는 얘기를 해줬던 것이 굉장히 기억에 남는 것 같습니다. 자 그러면 저희 토론자분들이 조금 궁금하신 부분들은 많이 답을 해주신 것 같고요. 이제 어, 여러분들께 혹시 궁금한 게 있으면 물어주십시오 하고 였습니다. 네, 우선 저쪽에 나, 남자분 네. 네, 발표 너무 잘 들었습니다. 저기 제가 궁금한 거는 그 먼저 네. 잠깐 자기 소개 간단하게 해 주시면 네, 저는 어, 디자인 쪽 공부 조금 하고 있고 개인 사업도 좀 디자인 관련해서 개인 사업하고 있는 김영진이라고 합니다. 저기 다름이 아닌 좀 궁금한 게그 사이먼 콜린 교수님한테 좀 많이 여쭤보고 싶은데요. 그러니까 지금 파슨스에서 이제 되게 유명하고 저명한 많은 디자이너를 배출하고 어떻게 보면은 그 상업적인 디자인에 대해서 되게 포커스를 좀 맞춰서 그 교육을 하고 계신데 그 혹시 그 다수를 위한 디자인과 어떻게 보면 이 아름다운 많은 디자인들이 너무 소수를 위한 지금 디자인들이지 않을까라는 생각이 좀 들거든요. 그래서 혹시 그 소외된 계층이나 그 다수를 위한 디자인에 대한 그뭐 교육이라든가 아니면 프로젝트를 혹시 진행했던 부분들이 혹시 있는지 뭐 사이먼 콜린 교수님도 좋고 다른 교수님들에게도 좀 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 네. That's an excellent question. Um, and I uh, the I believe very strongly in design for everyone. I don't believe in design just for people who've got a lot of money to spend on clothing. Um, <clears throat> I'm thrilled at what's happening in the US right now where people like H&M and Target are doing collaborations with leading designers, which means you can buy a Jason Wu dress for $75. I love that. You can buy a Comme des Garçons suit for $250. So we teach, you, you may not recall, but one of the slides I showed was the people that want to work with us and are working with us. Um, and first and foremost is the gap. So for 20 years, we've had a relationship with the gap. Because we believe very much in designers working at whatever level they choose. What I don't believe in is designers thinking they're working at one level when in fact they're working at another. So if I've got a designer who wants to do conceptual one-off pieces which are really going to end up in the Museum of, of Modern Art, great, I love that. If that's what they want to do, if they want to spend 11 weeks on one dress, then they're never going to sell it, but that's okay. That's not what they're doing it for. They're doing it because it's a conceptual piece and we completely support that. And if I've got a designer, which I had last year, who wanted to use $5 a yard jersey to produce a whole collection of about 30 pieces, which any one of which would have sold for maybe less than 100 bucks. I love that too. I will give him the tools in order for him to do that. So the point I'm making is that we strongly believe in, in quality of design in Spezzatura at every level, whether it's for the Gap, whether it's for Target, or whether it's for Louis Vuitton. Does that answer your question? 제가 관련해서 조금 궁금하셨던 부분 조금 보충 설명드리면 혹시 그런 경제적인 측면이나 가격적인 측면에서의 어, 디자인 말고 예를 들면 조금 어, 이렇게 저희가 전형적으로 생각하는 노멀 피플 이외에 핸디캡드 퍼슨이나 
혹은 뭔가 불편한 우리들하고 다른 정상인들하고 다른 사람들을 위한 디자인에 대해서는 고려 안 하고 계신지? Actually, um, yeah, we had a very good uh, example of that last year. I had a young lady who was um, an Orthodox Jewish person. So she had to wear, she had to cover her arms and legs down to the floor at all times. She could never, only her hands and face could ever be seen. Um, we also had a Muslim designer um, who wore a headscarf. Uh, and I remember very clearly because when it came to graduation, when she came on stage, she couldn't shake my hands because she's not allowed to touch a man. Um, so you know, we sort of bowed to each other instead. And so um, we gave them the tools to do that. And the, the Jewish lady, um, she was like, no one, there is no designer working on clothes for people like me. And one of the things I loved about that was that Jewish people and Muslims um, both have the same restrictions on clothing in many ways. And of course, as we know, they don't always get along in different countries. Um, but this was two examples of designers who had a particular mission and we gave them the skills they needed to achieve that. So I believe very strongly in, uh, in enabling design. Uh, see, I, if I've got one message, it's that design exists at every single level. At every single level, whether it's a $3 t-shirt or a $30,000 leather jacket, design is equally important. Both of those are the same. I've got equal respect for the guy that designs Levi's and for John Galliano. Thank you. I have a 저 차세대 영재 기업인 이기의 김혜수라고 하고 영어로 질문을 되죠. Um, you mentioned that we should always avoid bad design no matter what cost. Um, so I wanted to ask, you opened this edition of Vogue and you see this really beautiful couture dress, like something a few million dollars and you, we all say that it's beautiful, we all want to buy it, but we turn a few pages away and there's this photo from a runway show and well, Vogue says it's a brilliant design and, well, the meanings behind the design and on and on and on, but we see it as something like, why would anyone wear this? It looks so uncomfortable and it just looks weird. And then, is it just that we have less fashion insight to really notice this good design and just see it as a bad one? Or is it just relative and, yeah, everyone is right? Uh, every, it's a very, very good question. Um, actually, when you started it, I thought you were going to say something really different. I thought you were going to say, uh, you say you don't believe in bad design, so how do you explain your suit? <laughs> um, uh, I guess they didn't work in translation. Uh, you're, you're, it, the, the answer is this. <clears throat> uh, design is, good design is different to everyone. <clears throat> so, if, you know, every single person in this room has got a different point of view on what's good design. I love my suit. I think it's great. I've got it made for myself. I think it fits perfectly. And I'm sure half the people in this room are like, well, that doesn't fit him. That's too small. And you're right, except for you're not the people I'm trying to impress, the ones who don't like it. So the question, the, the answer really is that you have to design knowing what your market is, knowing who you're trying to impress. So the, the conceptual piece in Vogue, they probably designed that because they wanted to get attention. They probably don't care whether you like it or not. That's not, that, that's not their point. They're trying to um, get attention to get advertising. So there's a means to an end. So is it a beautiful solution? Mm, they may think so in which case good for them. We don't have to like it, but for them it's a beautiful solution. And, and you know, someone asked me, um, I got asked a very smart question recently, um, which, much like what you just said, which is, who decides if it's good design? How do you know if it's good design? And the answer, of course, is you can't. There is no answer. I'll give you my answer. And, you know, in the, the job that I have and the role that I have, some people listen to what I say, but I, I wouldn't expect people just to simply go, this to me is ugly, right? Sorry about this, but it is. I don't, you don't have to agree with me. I'll, I'll argue with you, but I respect your right to disagree. And so, you know, is this good design? No. To me, no, it's not. But you may think it is, and good for you. You know, like our phones, we've got, both got smartphones. I like mine more than yours. Okay. But that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean yours isn't a good design. It's just I prefer this one. So, you know, in answer to your question, of course, it's not a science. It's an art. You know, it's a matter of opinion. I have an opinion on design. And I, you know, might well agree with what you're saying. I might well not. You know, but I think understanding the reason behind it, and, you, and, and, and equally, I'll now contradict myself. Sometimes, no, don't understand the reason behind it. Just say, it's ugly, I don't like it, I don't care. Just say that. And sometimes you have to say that. I think there's, a, there's an existential um, perspective that's sometimes quite useful, which is ask of each thing what it is. If it's supposed to be a dress, but you can't walk in it, it's not really a dress, is it? You know, it's not. 
It might be beautiful, but it's not a dress. So, you know, there's lots of different ways of approaching it, and there is no single answer. 어, 저희 남편이 저희 핸드폰 디자인 한 디자이너이기 때문에 아마 사이먼 콜린스의 얘기를 들으면 굉장히 슬퍼할 것 같습니다. <웃음> Maybe he, he heard it. <웃음> 네, 네. 여기 지금. 아, 콜린스 교수 저 좋은 말씀 아주 감명 깊게 들었습니다. 그리고 세분 선생님들 아주 좋은 코멘트 해 주셨고요. 저는 심리학을 가르치는 선생인데 어, 심리학과 디자인의 접합, 결합 이런 때 개인적으로 관심을 오래전부터 가지고 있습니다. 최근에 동경을 들러서 국제학회를 갔는데 그 전에 젊은 사람들이 디자인을 여러 측면에서 디자인을 하면서 인더스트리부터 시작해서 소사이티 체인지까지 하는 모습을 보고 상당히 그 감명을 받았습니다. 그래서 파슨스에서는 어 심리학과 <웃음> 그 디자인을 어떻게 결합시키는 프로그램이 있는지 어떻게 하시는지 거기에 대해서 조금 힌트를 주시면 감사하겠습니다. That's a good question and I'm, I'm just a simple designer so I don't know how qualified I am to answer that. Um, but I can tell you, uh, one of the things that's very special about Parsons is we're part of the New School University. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the New School University is about 10,000 students of which 5,000 are in Parsons. So the others are studying liberal arts and they're studying um, anthropology and all the other myriad things that incorporate liberal arts. And as a Parsons student, you have the opportunity of studying those disciplines as well just as those students have the opportunity of studying design. So, <coughs> excuse me, in a design class, you might well be surrounded by students that are studying completely different topics. You know, they might be doing anthropology or, or, or international affairs or many of the other things that we do. Um, so I feel like we, I mean, you made the, the excellent point about place. Um, that Parsons is special because we're in New York, but we're also special because we're in the new school. You know, we're around these people. New York is a, is a, a, a boiling cauldron of culture, and you can't escape it. It permeates everything that you do. And I think, uh, you know, while I'm not qualified to talk about um, psychology, I think that um, the other things that happen in New York and that happen in the New School all are part of the Parsons education. You cannot be a, a Parsons student without being exposed to all of that. And so I think by default, if not by design, <laughs> forgive me, um, but for, the, for that reason, students are exposed to, uh, to that kind of discipline. Did I get away with it? Oh, the answer is clear. Oh, Mr. Mcnamara. I'll just add a little bit more. I went to the English literature class. I remember the professor. Arnold Klein. I went to the Parsons Design School. I could hear such a high level of English literature. I couldn't imagine it. So I was very impressed. I was very satisfied with the result. I was very impressed. So the New School's strength is the fact that it provides such a great liberal arts education. 네, 답이 되셨습니까? 네. 네, 여기 가운데 남자분 노란 티셔츠 입으신 분. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, presentation and uh, three professors about explaining your experiences in Parsons. Uh, my name is Chong Woo Seok. I'm from Chungang University and I would like to ask about uh, a certain thing about money. Uh, definitely uh, Parsons is one of uh, as I know, one of the most expensive uh, tuition school that I know of. And there are many students who wish to step into fashion industry by starting with Parsons. And I would like to know that uh, are there any students who are financially supported in Parsons? And uh, is there any uh, future vision or uh, prospects for increasing this uh, fashion education to more people? Uh, I come from a country, when I went to school, uh, I didn't pay any tuition charges. I actually got paid to go to school in England. I got a grant from the government which covered all my living expenses so I could study. And to me, that's normal. That's what's supposed to happen. At Parsons, we're actually one of the most expensive schools in the world. Um, it's, it's amazing how much money it costs to go to Parsons. Uh, and we don't make any money. The staff don't get paid very much. You know, the building is kind of ratty, it's kind of crumbly. 
It's not like a posh university, because we're in the middle of Manhattan. It's crazy. Why, would, why on earth are we in Greenwich Village, one of the most expensive real estate places in the world, and that's where our school is? And of course the answer is that for the, for the place, you know, we have to be there. But that's not an excuse, that's just the simple reality of the situation. Um, in answer to your question, I, my job, I, I do many different things in my job. I run the school, I go around the world talking about the school, but one of the reasons I do that is to raise money. I go around the world, I talk to big corporations, I say, give me money. Give me money so that I can pay for students to come to my school. So that when I find a student who's really talented and wants to come and study at Parsons, I can help them. We give a, we give a discount to every single student in the school. Um, and we, we find ways of funding them in, in myriad different ways, whether it's working with a corporation or another partner or a local government or something, to try and help them through. Much of what we, the university does, we have a whole office of financial aid, and they work desperately hard to try and ensure that students are not disadvantaged by their income. And frankly, they are disadvantaged. It's tough. I'm not going to lie about it. It's tough. And if a student doesn't have money, it's very difficult for them. We'll help them as much as we possibly can, and I want to help them more, but it's, it's very difficult. What I can tell you is that no amount of money will make anyone a better designer. So if a student's at my school and they've got tons of cash, which is often the case, just because they spend it all on luxury fabrics does not make them a better designer. And the, the chap I mentioned earlier who used the $5 a yard jersey, he was a brilliant designer. He'll go a long way. So money doesn't help. All people have to do is find a way to get through the school. Um, my, one of my most important roles is to raise money. We do the fashion benefit every year that raises $1.5 million for scholarships. Just scholarships, that's all. All of the projects that I do, all of them, whether it's with Louis Vuitton or PPR or anyone, generates revenue which I give to the students. So you know, we do all we can. It's not enough. It's not. If, if I could raise hundreds of millions of dollars, then every student would get through there free. That's what I want. The last thing I would say is that for our MFA program, the one that I mentioned, it's 18 students. We, it's such a prestigious program, we managed to raise a lot of money for that. So at least two, if not more, students go through on 100% scholarship. They don't pay anything. And then a further probably six to eight of them get a very, very reduced scholarship rate. So you know, we do what we can. America, the American education system is a very expensive one. And I, you know, I, I can't defend it. I don't come from that but I'm just doing everything I can to try and alleviate that burden. Okay, thank you. Another question. Here is your question. I am a child in the United States of the United States of the United States. I have a question for you. The good design and bad 근데 그 학교에서 학생들을 뽑거나 교육을 할때 어, 지도하실 때그 기준을 어떻게 설정하시고 어, 만약에 제가 어떤 작품을 만들었는데 저는 되게 예쁘다고 생각하는데 학장님께서는 되게 못났다고 생각하시면 은 그거는 그 학생의 창의성이나 이런 거를 저해하는 건 아닌지 그런 질문을 드리고 싶습니다. Well, I'm right, obviously. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> No, I'm not right. Uh, and actually, that's a very good question. Uh, and I'll tell you what we do. Uh, when our students do their thesis collections, um, they, at the end of the senior year in the undergraduate program, they do a thesis collection. So you've got perhaps 230 students, all of them with six outfits. So how do you judge? Well, the way that we do it is we bring in a panel of industry experts. So we, for two weeks, we have a, a session every morning and every afternoon. We bring in a different panel of experts, so they sit like you people are in the front row, and the students present their work, and they score them. And that might be the fashion director from Bergdorf Goodman, it might be Reed Krakow from Coach, it might be Mickey Boardman from Paper Magazine, Julie Gilhart from Barney. So these are industry leaders, and they're all different. And they sit there, and they all score. And then at the end of that, we have the winner from each section, and then we put them all together, and we do it again. So that's how we choose the designer of the year. So the answer, of course, the short answer is nobody's right. Nobody is. But more people listen to Anna Wintour than listen to me. So you know, if there's me and her sitting here, they're going to listen to her, not me. More people listen to me than listen to someone else. So you, know, you have a, a strength of opinion based on your background. You know, some people trust my vision on design. Some people don't. Some people think I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. And you know, they might be right. To them, I, uh, that's right. So, you know, the, the, it's a very good question, and there is no simple answer. But at the end of the day, if you create something and nobody wants it, 
then it's hard to argue that that was good design because you're the only person that thinks so. And that doesn't mean that the more people that like it, the better it is, because then you would say that McDonald's is the best food in the world, and clearly it's garbage. So there's no, there's no simple answer. The question is, who were you, and this goes back to what I said earlier on, who were you designing for? If I design something and it's for you, and you don't like it, then it was not a good design. But if I design something for, for you, and they don't like it, I don't care. I designed it for you. So it's, it is entirely in the eye of the beholder, and it's up to you who you just choose to be that beholder. It's a very good question. I like that. One more question. I'm in Go Eun-kyung. I'm from Esmode Seoul. I'm in the city of Esmode Seoul. I'm in the city of Esmode Seoul. 지어진 지 23년이 되었고요. 다양한 그 콜라보레이션과 기업 밀착형 교육을 하기 위해서 굉장히 애쓰고 있습니다. 아까 그 파슨스의 그각 기업들과의 다양한 콜라보레이션과 협조 또그 모든 그 지역의 수화치까지 쉽게 구할 수 있는 그 환경이 정말 한편으로는 부럽기도 한데요. 지금 우리나라의 그 많은 디자이너들이 세계적으로 많이 활동을 하기 위해서 글로벌 그 시장으로 나가서 활동하기 위해서 여러 가지 애를 쓰고 있는데 실제로 꼭 파슨스가 좋은 학교지만 파슨스를 나온 학생들만 그 유명한 세계적인 디자이너가 되라는 법은 없고 한국에서 교육받은 친구들도 세계적으로 나가서 훌륭한 디자이너고 해외에서 충분히 활동할 수 있는 경쟁력이 있다고 생각합니다. 그렇다면 그 근데 한국적으로는 조금 아쉬운 점이 있다면 어 지금 한류 열풍을 타고 한국에 와서 공부하고 싶어하는 굉장히 많은 세계의 그 사람들이 저희 학교로도 문의를 오고 있는데 제도적인 뒷받침이 안 돼서 실제로 뭐 학생 비자 발급이라든지 이런데 문제가 있어서 받, 받지 못하는 그런 어려운 상황에 있습니다. 근데 한국적인 디자이너들이 우리나라의 디자이너들이 세계 시장에 나가서 활동하기 위해서 우리나라에서 교육받은 한국에서 교육받은 학생들이 경쟁력을 갖추기 위해서 꼭 필요한 점은 무엇이라고 생각하시는지 한국적인 교육 프로그램도 옆에 계신 교수님들 통해서 많이 들으셨을 거라고 생각하는데요. 그건 무엇이라고 생각하시는지 좀 여쭙고 싶습니다. So, unfortunately, you just asked me exactly the question that I've been getting around the world, which I think the, the problem is in the question. What does it take for a Korean designer to be global? Stop being a Korean designer. That's it. Be a global designer. Stop thinking of yourself as Korean. It doesn't work if you think of yourself as Korean. It doesn't. Like Calvin Klein is the quintessential American brand designed by a Brazilian. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work. And there are no excuses either. If you want to be a brilliant designer, be a brilliant designer. And if you want to design a global line, design a global line. I was at a conference in Paris last week and they were whining on about uh, why Shanghai isn't a fashion capital and all the economic reasons and the infrastructural reasons and all that. It's not true, it's rubbish. The reason it's not a fashion capital is there's not enough good design there for people to bother to go and look at it. I mean, it's a harsh reality and people don't like to hear it, but it's a fact. Yes, there are great advantages in New York because there are great designers there, but if Anna Wintour said to all of the designers in New York, right, we're all moving to Milwaukee, they'd have to move to Milwaukee. And then Milwaukee would be a great global capital. That's how it goes. It's like if the design is good enough, then it becomes a global capital. And if a designer wants to have a global brand, they have to think of themselves as a global brand. You know, it just, it, it, like, I, it perplexes me when I go around the world and I see um, uh, presentations which are nationally themed. So, you know, the, the trade commissions in, in the US often bring over brands from their own countries and say, look, it's the British themed thing or it's the Italian themed thing or the Korean themed thing. And it turns me right off. Like, if I wanted to see British design, I'd go to Britain. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I want to see global design. And so in order for a Korean, this is the fact, in order for a Korean designer to have a global brand, they've got to stop thinking of themselves as a Korean designer. And that's just my humble opinion. I might be wrong, but I stand by it. Yes, thank you. I'm going to ask you the question of time. I'm going to ask you the question of the time. I'm going to ask you the question of the time. I'm going to ask you the question of the time. 
어, 지금 굉장히 세계적으로 어, 좋은 어, 패션 교육을 하는 교육자 입장에서 혹은 학교 관계자 입장에서 이 변화해가는 이 패션 시스템과 어, 환경, 세계적인 환경에 대응하기 위해서 앞으로 패션 디자인 교육에 있어서 혹은 디자인 교육에 있어서 가장 중요한 것, 다가오는 미래에 가장 중요한 포인트가 어떤 것이 될 거라고 생각하시는지 의견을 엿짚고 세션을 마치도록 하겠습니다. 이거 t 치 e 피 to ask smart questions. That's what it is. You've got to be constantly learning. I often start a speech by saying I'm the dumbest person in the room. Because I am. I think I'm the dumbest person in this room right now. That's me. I'm the dumbest person. Because I can learn from everyone in here. And I've been quite successful in design. And I'm, you know, I've got a good job. People listen to what I say. But I'm the dumbest person in the room. Because I need to learn from all of you. And that's what we've got to teach our designers to do. Question everything. Like I, I was just talking to a guy earlier on today, and he was saying he works for this big company, and they just launched a new brand, and they've got 100 stores in their first season. And I said, what's the brand like? He went, oh, it looks like Polo. Ugh, give me a break. I don't even want to hear about it. Like, that's the problem. The solution is something new, something innovative, something open. You know, we need, we need the Facebook of fashion. And that, 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 as we all know, Facebook didn't come about because a corporation commissioned him to do it, and they thought, where's the white space? Let's you know, get a team on it. No. It was a raw concept, a raw idea, which he pushed through and became wildly successful. And that's what you have to look out for. And the longer corporations in this country and around the world frustrate design, they say they indulge design, but they don't. They, they want design right up until it conflicts with their own corporate infrastructure, and then they don't want it anymore. So as long as that continues, it won't work. So we have to teach our designers to ask difficult questions and look for solutions, look for beautiful solutions. 모든 음, 여러분께 감사드리고 오늘 디스커션에 힘써주신 이문혁 교수님 그리고 어, 김승현 교수님 감사드립니다. 어, 사이먼 콜린스 딘에게 박수로 감사의 표현을 하면서 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. <웃음> <웃음> <웃음>